Hi everyone, I'm Shelly from There's No Place Like Home at redheadmom8.wordpress.com. Today I'm bringing you the second installment of my Hidden Curriculum and Public Education series. Now If you missed the first installment of this series, it was actually about how public education teaches confusion. And if you're not really sure what the hidden curriculum even is, what it is, is it is a series of quote lessons that are unintentionally, schools say unintentionally, but I, I really think differently about that, but they say it is lessons that are unintentionally taught in school in addition to the regular curricu curriculum that is being taught to kids everywhere. Um, this is truly the most national curriculum that kids will have, and again, it has nothing to do with academics. It is a series of lessons that are kind of in the background of every single school. And again, the very first installment of this was about confusion. You can go back and watch that if you would like to before you watch this. It doesn't really matter what order you watch them in. But today I'm going to talk to you about how public education and the hidden curriculum teaches kids about their class position. Now I'm gonna do this video a little bit differently than I did the last one. Today I decided that I am just going to read to you what John Taylor Gatto has to say about this. It's only three paragraphs long and really you cannot beat John Taylor Gatto's words because he himself was right there in the trenches teaching in schools and he has he had such a heart for children and he actually eventually ended up quitting teaching because he said he was no longer willing to hurt children. So I'm going to just quickly read to you the three paragraphs of what John Taylor Gatto has to say about how it teaches class position. And then I am going to afterwards bring you some of my thoughts about this because I have had some experience with this myself. The second lesson I teach, again, this is John Taylor Gatto speaking. The second lesson I teach is class position. I teach that students must stay in the class where they belong. I don't know who decides my kids belong there, but that's not my business. The children are numbered so that if any get away, they can be returned to the right class. Over the years, the variety of ways children are numbered by schools has increased dramatically until it is hard to see the human beings plainly under the weight of numbers they carry. Numbering children is a big and very profitable undertaking, though what the strategy is designed to accomplish is elusive. I don't even know why parents would, without a fight, allow it to be done to their kids. In any case, that's not my business. My job is to make them like being locked together with children who bear numbers like their own, or at least to endure it like good sports. If I do my job well, the kids can't even imagine themselves somewhere else because I've shown them how to envy and fear the better classes and how to have contempt for the dumb classes. Under this efficient discipline, the class mostly polices itself into good marching order. That's the real lesson of any rigged competition like school. You come to know your place. In spite of the overall class blueprint that assumes that 99% of the kids are in their class to stay, I nevertheless make a public effort to exhort children to higher levels of test success, hinting at eventual transfer from the lower class as a reward. I frequently insinuate the day will come when an employer will hire them on the basis of test scores and grades, even though my own experience is that employers are rightly indifferent to such things. I never lie outright, but I've come to see that truth and school teaching are, at bottom, incompatible, just as Socrates said thousands of years ago. The lesson of numbered class is that everyone has a proper place in the pyramid and that there is no way out of your class except by number magic. Failing that, you must stay where you, where you are put. So think about that. If you have any experience at all with the public education system, whether it's through your children being there or through your own experience, I think that most of us would remember that classes were put in kind of a pecking order. There was, you know, the, the smart kids and the kids who were kind of, you know, just, just average. And then there were the, the special ed kids, the kids that all of the kids in the higher levels were almost brainwashed to stigmatize these lower classes. So what John Taylor Gatto speaks about here is, is so absolutely true, and I think that we have all experienced this. Because not only are kids locked into these certain positions, these certain levels in schools, they very, very often will never get out of them. 
no matter how well they do. And actually, if you've ever heard of John Holt, he actually talked about this in one of his books too. He spoke of when he was substitute teaching in a third grade class, and it was a third grade class of really, really poor readers. And there was one little girl in the class who just read fluently, and he could not understand for the life of him why she was in this class. So he brought her up to, well, he, he told her to come up to him after class, and he talked to her about it, and she even said to him, I can even read my older brother who's in middle school. I can read his books too. And she pulled out one of her older brother's chapter books that she actually had in her backpack because she liked to read, and she read it to John Holt. So he then went to the principal and was questioning, well, why is she in this class? And they basically really got angry with him. And they said, well, she must have memorized that part. She was tricking you. And they were very, very condescending about the whole thing. Well, John Holt kept pressing the issue, which I admire because, again, at the time, he was just a substitute here. And until they got to the point where they finally tested her and they found that yes she was well well above the reading level of the other kids in her class and what had happened is that when kids who and this is this really goes across the board when kids are in kindergarten they tend to be grouped together with certain kids and wherever they are grouped that very often lasts throughout all of their years of school and they're real it's almost impossible for them to get out of that group so you know you've got the group of gifted and honors kids and you've got the group of as I was saying earlier you know like the, the kids who, who do well they, they just kind of do do on average and then you have at, at what they would consider the bottom very often these are the special the special education kids the kids with ADHD and other sorts of similar issues and you know as I was reading this I I myself even understood exactly what he was talking about and I've said this in several of my other videos, so forgive me if you've already heard this story, but I think that it really goes well with what we're talking about today, is that, you know, when I was in high school, I was, I was in the gifted and honors classes. And at one point, I tried to get my guidance counselor to let me take math courses that were on the business track, rather than college prep. And my, my counselor would not allow me to take any, any classes that were on the business track. In fact, he would rather have me take no math than take business math. And that is exactly what happened my senior year. I took no math my senior year simply because my counselor did not want to let me take the business math that I asked for. So I can see how true this is. Kids who are locked into these levels, into these tracks, into these positions in school, they do that for a reason. And very often, it's not for the reason that so many of us think. You know, when I was in those gifted and honors classes, I'm going to admit, I was proud of that fact. I knew that I was in the highest section that there was. I knew that like I was at the top of the food chain. And our teachers very often ground into us the fact that we were better than everyone else. They ground into the fact they ground into us the fact that the kids down at the bottom, oh, you just wanted to stay away from them. And so when Gatto alluded to that about how, you know, kids are taught who to, who to fear and who to look down upon. That is exactly what happens, whether unintentionally by the teachers or whether intentionally, because I'm sure that there are some, some teachers who, who really aren't trying to do that. But yeah, I'm pretty sure there are other teachers who, who do it on purpose. That is exactly what happens, though. And, you know, as I was saying earlier, we... we tend to think of like these groupings being done because of intelligence. And I've come to realize that that's not what it's about at all. You know, we always think of the, the gifted and honored students being placed where they are because they have high IQs, which, you know, I, I will say that you did have to take an IQ test at my school to, to be um, put into the gifted class. But I no longer think that that really has a whole lot to do with who is placed in the gifted and honors classes. Because what I saw, at least at my school, in my experience with the gifted and honors students, is that we were the students who perfectly fit the school box. 
We were the students who were happy to do whatever the teachers told us to do, and were, were also happy to let others know what they had to do. You know, a lot of times they would have me tutoring other students, like in middle school, I would go in and tutor other kids. And I think that it's all about obedience. That is how a lot of kids end up in those upper classes is yeah they might have high IQs they might be extremely intelligent but I don't think that that's what got them there I think what got them there is the fact that they know how to play the school the school role and not so much that they know how to play it because it's not like they're doing it on purpose it's just that they fit that mold that is exactly who these schools want to be in those upper classes and then, you know, the, the next tier down, you know, like the, the more average kids, they might have a little bit of issues, but, you know, not, not, they're not as obedient as those kids in the gifted classes, but, you know, they're not as unruly as the kids in the lower classes and very often in those special education classes. And so that, that's what I was really thinking about with the special education classes, because yes, those are the positions that other students are taught. Yes, they're taught to look down on these students. And you know, I have a son with ADHD. He, he was getting learning support when he was in school. So I, I have a completely different perspective. You know, have, you know I was, as a, as a kid myself, you know, I was up here and then my son, even though he was brilliant, was kind of down here because he was labeled as ADHD. And so I started thinking to myself, if the gifted students are up here because they are very obedient, those kids down at the bottom, they're there because they are the students that the teachers have to watch out for. They are the students who are most likely to speak up and to question things. And that is not what these schools want want. And you know, if you actually go back and look at the history of public education, and actually right now I am reading another book by John Taylor Gatto. It's a really huge book called um, The Underground History of American Education. And this delves even further into the history of education. I will talk about it sometime once I finish it, but I'm not very far in. But what I have learned is that these positions in schools they're there mainly for um, almost like a caste system. You have those gifted and honor students. They are the kids that they are looking to one day take those managerial positions. They are the kids that they are happy to place above others because they are the kids that, yes, they will have people above them because those real, you know, the big wigs, the really people who are really high up there, of course, they are the students who will go to private schools and will very often not have an education that looks anything remotely like what public education does. And again, that is all for a reason. They are given a different education because the public education system is not about making kids more intelligent, whereas the private um, education system is. So again, you've got the gifted and the honors kids. They're, they're one day hoping to put those kids in managerial positions in school, or not in school, in the workplace. And then below them, you will have the, you know, those kids who were average in school, you know, did well, but didn't do excellently. That is, that is the workforce. You know, those are the people working those office jobs. You know, that's just kind of, they're, they're just the herd. And then below them, those kids who were labeled and stigmatized, they, by this, by the point that they are out of school, any sort of individuality that they had, any sort, any um, passion for speaking out that they once had, any sort of courageousness that they once had, is very, very often crushed out of them by the time that they graduate high school. Because... Who wants to speak up and ask questions when people are already looking down on you? When people are already thinking that you are less intelligent, that you are less important, and they start to believe this about themselves. So that is exactly why they put them where they do in these schools. It is to crush their spirits and it works. For the most part, it works. And where do a lot of these students end up? 
why that's the menial caste. They are the people who, who are doing, you know, like very often janitorial work, nothing at all down to, to like put my nose down at janitorial work because my mom was a cleaning supervisor for years, you know, so I definitely not putting my nose down, but I'm saying this is what ends up happening. They, they are put into the menial labor, the labor that a lot of people do look down their noses at. Why? Because their spirit has been crushed. Any sort of speaking out that they once would have wanted to do is no longer really an option for them. So this whole positional system in the public school system, yes, you know, it is far, far more important than we believe. Because if you think about it, what would happen if they would allow these kids, you know, who do speak up, who do ask questions, who do, who aren't afraid to disagree with teachers, if they would allow those kids up at the top, what would happen? What would happen to our workforce where we would have a, a whole slew of managers who no longer did as they were told and then just passed that down the line, but instead were constantly questioning things? And, you know, I wish that I would have um, would have written it down, but I came across a quote and I don't remember exactly what it said. But the gist of it was that the public education system is never going to teach students what they need to know in order to overthrow them. And that is exactly the case. I actually think it was the government, but public education is run by the government. So the government will never teach students what they need to know in order to one day overthrow them. And that is exactly the case. They have got to keep kids in their place. And very early on, it is observed how these kids are. And yes, these kids are numbered. And these standardized tests, don't. we won't even get into that today, but these standardized tests, yes, another way of numbering these children. So what do we have so far that kids are most often learning in the public education system? It's not academics. So far, they are learning confusion, how nothing seems to relate to one another, and they are learning class position. They are learning if they think they're more important than others versus those who now learn that they're not worth anything. And if you look at kids today, you're going to see that that is the curriculum that is sticking with these kids, nothing academic. So anyway, that's all that I have for this installment. Um, I will have next month's installment out um, probably around the 1st of January. Anyway, if you like this video, I would love if you would give it a thumbs up just so that I know that you watched it and, and liked what I had to say. And again, I just really want to thank you so much for your support. And I hope you have a great, great holiday.